commission meeting. <coughs> First item of the evening is to adopt the agenda. Commissioners, staff, do you have any changes or additions? Nope. Seeing none, can I get a motion to move? So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, the next item on the agenda is to approve the minutes from May 20th, 2019. Uh, any changes or additions, commissioners, staff? Nothing from staff. Commissioners? No. Nope. Okay, then let's move on to citizens' comments. Um, and is there any citizens who'd like to comment tonight? Being none, we'll go to our first presentation. And our first presentation is a review of the Burnsville Stormwater Pollution Prevention Program and the 2018 annual report. And we'll have Emily Erdell from SEH Incorporated present us to this night. Uh, good evening and thanks for having me again to present on the City of Burnsville's MS4 program. Um, specifically here tonight to talk about the 2018 annual report. Um, a quick review of what we are going to talk about this evening, um, a brief overview of the NPDES program, um, which is uh, kind of the background of why Burnsville is an MS4 city. Um, we'll specifically talk about Burnsville's MS4 permit, uh, the status of compliance for the 2018 reporting year, uh, touch on a couple calendar year 2018 highlights, and a brief uh, look forward into the future of the MS4 permit. Um, so the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, is a federal program that was established with the Clean Water Act. Um, this federal program passes the administration down to the state level. So here in the state of Minnesota, we report to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, or the MPCA. Um, City of Burnsville is a phase two small MS4. And what that means is that they have a general MS4 permit. It's the same permit that several of the neighboring communities have. Um, a phase one MS4 would be a larger city like Minneapolis or St. Paul and they have an individual permit. Uh, coverage under the general permit began in 2003 and it has been reissued twice since then in 2006 and 2013. Uh, currently the MS4 permit is expired. Legally, communities can operate under an expired permit until the MPCA reissues a new one. That's expected in fall of this year, so there will be a new permit up ahead. So the MS4 permit, again, um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but MS4 stands for Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, and that means that the city owns and operates a storm sewer that's not combined with sanitary, um, and they're responsible for keeping it in working order and clean. Um, as part of an MS4 permit, the city has what we call a SWIP, and it's a stormwater pollution prevention plan. And within that SWIP, there are six minimum control measures. And which, within those minimum control measures, there are best management practices, which we commonly call BMPs, and measurable goals. Uh, there are several acronyms with this program. So um, please, please, you know, stop me if I start rattling off and um, no one's following. <clears throat> so the minimum control measures, as I mentioned, there are six of them, and they are uh, public education and outreach, public participation and involvement, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site runoff control, post-construction runoff control, pollution prevention uh, or good housekeeping for municipal activities, um, and then in addition to those minimum control measures, there's a couple other components kind of depending on um, where the city is located. And um, here in the city of Burnsville, they are part of a TMDL, which is a total maximum daily load. So they have a, another component to, to their SWIP, um, which is basically a spreadsheet tracking system for that. Um, all of these minimum control measures are, it's kind of really the meat of the MS4 permit. It's where you're going to find a lot of the associated information. Um, so there is a reporting process that the city is required to do, which is why we're here today. Um, to talk about the annual report, which will cover activities in the 2018 calendar year from January 1st to December 31st. The report is a summary of what was done in 2018. <clears throat> Excuse me. It must be submitted online by June 30th of this year. The draft is completed and is posted on the city's website. I know it's a little tough to see on the slide, but that is a link to where you can find this information. So as part of the annual report process, the city does a self-assessment 
um, and that's kind of gathering the information in preparation for the annual report. Uh, the city met the requirements for the 2018 reporting year. Um, data this for the last couple years, but it's, it's good to add that the city was audited in February of 2016. They were found to be in compliance with the audit with the MPCA. That's great news. The MPCA audits, they say it's like an, it's an audit cycle. I've heard about once every seven years. There's definitely no guarantee on that time frame, though. It could happen sooner or later. Um, so now we're going to transition to the 2018 highlights by minimum control measure. So the first one is public education and outreach. Um, here we have a summary of all the different educational materials that the city of Burnsville has used to reach out to the public um, and then an estimation of the total circulation of those items. Um, the city focused on helping residents understand the connection between storm drains, the storm sewer, and local water resources through these materials. And additionally, they added budget this year for the development of a school education program related to water quality. Um, I also, there's, there's quite a few words here on this slide, um, not necessarily the intent to read them all, but just to show that, um, and this wasn't even all of them, that the city has participated in quite a few water quality events. So in addition to the educational materials, they're also doing that outreach um, through educational events through the uh, agencies in the area, lake associations, um, other type of things. So they're doing a great job at getting out to the public. Minimum control measure two, public particip participation and involvement. Uh, the, the main purpose of this minimum control measure is that the city is required to solicit input on their SWIP or their stormwater program to the public. Um, any comments that are received um, on the SWIP or about the SWIP, the city is required to consider and respond to. Um, you can see here the past few years there haven't been a ton of comments um, and during the annual meetings. That's not totally unusual. Um, you know, it's it just kind of is what it is. But, um, you know, that's at the particular annual meeting. It's not to say people don't call throughout the year and, and have other types of questions. Uh, minimum control measure three is illicit discharge detection and elimination. Uh, the purpose of this minimum control measure is that city staff are trained to recognize and respond to illicit discharges. Illicit discharges are defined as really anything other than stormwater that's entering the MS4. Um, it's, a, it's a big component of the MS4 program. And to keep track, um, in addition to just those visual inspections you do during your day-to-day -day operations, staff also annually inspect outfalls and priority areas to really look for um, any type of illicit discharge that they could prevent into the system. So in 2018, there were four illicit discharges reported. Three were reported by public, and one was reported by a city staff member. Uh, staff followed up on all those illicit discharges, and there were three verbal warnings issued, and that took care of the issue. There were no further action uh, following those verbal warnings. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Minimum control measure four is construction site stormwater runoff controls. Um, so this is making sure that all those active construction sites in the city of Burnsville are meeting the requirements to protect the MS4. Um, so the state of Minnesota is really only concerned with construction sites that are greater than one acre. Obviously, there are several sites that happen that are less than an acre, and the city of Burnsville themselves has requirements for those, but it's just not reported to the state. So when you see here that there were eight projects reviewed, those were really only eight projects greater than an acre. I'm sure there were several that were under. Um, of those eight projects that were reviewed, there were 11 active construction sites greater than an acre. And of those 11, there were 127 inspections. So I have an inspection summary. You can see that there was 59 notice of violations given out. Um, it seems like a little bit of a big number, but um, you can see there were no stop work orders, no forfeit of bond money. Um, basically, those, those notice of violations are proactive things that city staff are seeing. They're reminding you know, contractors, hey, you need to clean up a little bit of dirt here or there. And then the issue kind of stops there. So it's a good thing that they're being proactive and, and staying on the contractors to do their best. Uh, minimum control measure five, post-construction stormwater management for new and redevelopment. Uh, so this, is, this minimum control measure really focus, focuses on what happens after the construction project is done. 
and there is a new pond or infiltration area, what we like to call BMP, best management practice on site. Um, so the city continued to implement and enforce uh, their program to address those post-construction needs. Um, and the big one here is, you know, when we redevelop a site and we add new impervious surfaces, that we're protecting the sensitive areas, um, the lake, lakes, wetlands, and the black dog preserve. And we're doing that through treatment ponds, grass whales, infiltration practices. And it's really important that the city has been focusing on entering in long-term maintenance agreements just to make sure that not only are these things being put in the ground, but they're functioning. Uh, Burnsville, the city of Burnsville um, requires that pre-development runoff rates are matched. And what that means is um, someone who's doing new development is not allowed to increase their stormwater's rate. So if you think of a large area that was grass but is now a parking lot, water is able to move much faster. And when water moves faster, it has the potential to impact some downstream things. So they have to ca capture that water and slow it down. Um, also, minimum, uh, minimal impact design standards, um, or MIDS, another acronym. acronym. Um, this is the uh, volume control. So they are required to uh, treat so much volume of their new impervious services on site. Minimum control measure six is pollution prevention and good housekeeping for municipal operations. Um, I like to call this the practice what you preach uh, minimum control measure and there's a lot of responsibility in this minimum control measure for the city to also keep up with their stormwater infrastructure um, and inspect everything and make sure it's in good working order. Um, so as you can see the city owns 108 structural stormwater BMPs um, which would be anything constructed to treat stormwater, excluding a pond, because it has its own category here. Um, 1,277 outfalls. Um, an outfall is a point source where water leaves um, the city's MS4 and either enters a receiving water or leaves their jurisdiction. Um, and 472 stormwater ponds. So of those, 100% of the structural stormwater BMPs were inspected, which is a requirement. And outfalls saw 5% inspected and ponds saw 14. Um, in the past, those numbers have been, those uh, outfalls and ponds have been closer to 20%. Um, however, since we were in the last year of the permit cycle, I think they were just trying to do whatever hadn't been done before because the requirement for those two is, <clears throat> excuse me, ponds and outfalls that you inspect 100% in the permit term. And we were in the last year of the permit term, mm -hmm. so they took care of what they had to, and now um, in this year, 2019, we, we start over again. Um, so I'm gonna make a transition to some uh, 2018 project highlights. So here we have the wood pond alum treatment. Um, this project was done in October of 2018. It was the final product of several outlined in the 2008 lake management plan to improve the water quality of Wood Pond. And the alum treatment is expected to provide benefits to, for 10 to 12 years. So we have a photo of the actual process happening and then a photo of some very clear water. You can see a large, I think, catfish mm -hmm. through the water there. So successful project. Um, another project to highlight is the slope stabilization study. This study was completed by WSB in 2018. It had three phases, a desktop analysis, um, a field verification, and a risk estimation. Uh, there were four categories of risk management. Um, those were management required, further study, monitoring, or no further action re required. And there are slope repair projects that are planned or proposed for, for 2019 with a budgeted cost of half a million dollars. And you can see there's a photo there that shows um, a steeper slope where you have a little bit of scour happening that could potentially undermine that, that slope there. Um, there are three sites. Here I have site one, slope stabilization study area, site two, and site three. So we'll kind of jump ahead here looking forward. As I mentioned that the permit will be reissued this fall. Um, so what that means is, is there's a future reauthorization application that's gonna come sometime in the fall. And that's gonna be um, a process for the city to figure out what they need to do to meet the intent of the new MS4 permit. 
Um, when they complete that and send in that application, coverage will be extended. Um, sometime in winter 2020, maybe even a little later, there is a public comment period in between there um, for the MPCA um, and the citizens of Burnsville to comment on the, their application for reauthorization. And following that uh, issuance of permit coverage, there will be program updates that will be initiated. Um, it's looking like at this time there's only draft language out, but the city will have about 12 months to complete those once that uh, coverage is extended. So the next steps for tonight, if there are any comments on the MS4 program, um, again, we'll, we'll consider that input. <coughs> Excuse me. And any changes, uh, any changes that come from those comments will be documented within the 2019 annual report, um, as well as the city SWIP. Um, I'm here for questions or comments tonight, if you may have any. Otherwise, I will direct you to Jen. Her information is on the last slide here, and she's available uh, following this meeting and during your regular work day um, for those who are watching this presentation. Commissioners, any questions? I have a couple. Mm -hmm. Sure. So on page, on agenda item four, I think it's a portion where we talk about um, the total circulation and audience and table format. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that really you're just looking at circulation and audience, but it's not really open rates or anything like that or click-through rates. Is there a reason why it's just audience and circulation and not actually how many people are consuming those different types of media? Uh, that would be, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know the particular answer of that. That is how the MPCA has been soliciting this information. Um, I think that that's something that they probably would consider. However, you know, hmm, I'm trying to think, it, it could be very difficult to track in those instances, but you know, it's maybe something they'll further develop in the future with the requirement, but at this time, they're really only looking for the potential circulation. Sure. So on that same topic, under the description of activity, um, specifically for the clean water workshops. Mm -hmm. You have 68 residents that participated. I'm guessing those 68 were at sessions that Caleb helped lead here on site. We have several other residents that are participating in other communities, and I believe the Soil and Water Conservation District would have access to whether or not those are Burnsville residents that are attending workshops in Lakeville or in Egan or Apple Valley. And that feels like important information because that would probably be the more... Um, and applicable number for whether or not we're helping out our storm water system uh, because those are open for kind of the the neighboring counties too so it might be interesting to see what that number comes out to be to figure out my guess is it might actually be larger than 68 hopefully that's clear I'm looking at Caleb if he yeah. Yeah, is tracking go ahead Caleb. <laughs> that is a summary of uh the Burnsville residents from the SWCD, from the county. So they, they tallied up for us and they gave us that number as last year's total. Okay, so I'll just repeat what Caleb said since uh, that probably wasn't completely picked up in the mic. <laughs> so the 68 is the number of residents that participated in any of the workshops, just not the number of residents that participated here on site. Yes. Okay, perfect. So never mind, you can scratch that comment. <laughs> Um, so my, sorry, I'm just going to keep going down my Go list ahead, of questions so somebody else grabs me. Um, so on question 27, there, it looks like there was four illicit discharges detected, yes. but there's only three yeah. warnings. So help me with the other one that wasn't so included there. It is quite possible that an illicit discharge was reported that maybe didn't exist. Um, the city does have a hotline set up where, um, residents can report an illicit discharge it's a responsibility of the city to investigate and follow up on those, and it's it's possible they just deem no further action necessary when they got there. Maybe it was, you know, a misunderstanding. Okay. Fair. One out, I have one last question. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to go. Um, so on MCM4, mm -hmm. so the runoff control, so I noticed that at the bottom we have the largest, on question 44, the largest number um, of kind of, actions that we took fall under the other category in terms of correction notice. Can you explain a little bit more about what that correction notice means? Sure. Are you sorry, meaning that I, in other, it, it says in there, does it follow with um, the written or verbal warning? I 
So uh, it says, what types of enforcement actions do you have available to compel compliance with your <clears throat> regulatory mechanism? And then it says, other describe correction notice number that were issued, 92. Sure. So the, the MPCA sets up these forms, and they have detailed what they call the different types of enforcement. So they may have written warning on there. Um, correction notice, I believe, is just the term the city of Burnsville uses. Um, and it doesn't fall into their kind of automated system to check. So that was, we added the other in, so the verbiage was the same, essentially. Um, so a correction notice is just like a, a version of a verbal warning, or is it? Um, I believe the correction notices are written. Yes, they are written notices that are handed out. Um, and again, it's, uh, it just is called something slightly different than the MPCA's templates. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Anyone else? So, question. So, what is the difference between verbal and written? I I understand it from mm -hmm. from language perspective, but what is that impact on it? So, no matter what the correspondence is, it needs to be documented. Um, I believe that a verbal warning um, is a slightly. Uh, less uh, uh, like a pre-step to the written warning you know maybe you're giving someone the chance like hey I'm out on site and I see something that needs to be fixed so I'm verbally telling you while I'm here hey can we can we please take care of this and I follow up you know in the 24-hour window and it's still not taken care of then I might initiate that written warning um, it just it kind of depends on um, how the inspector is handling that particular you know day that inspection those kind of things Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, curious about the slope stabilization. It didn't seem like there were a, a lot of projects, and I'm assuming that you know the there was first kind of a it, it sounded like it went through a desk analysis, then field checking. Um, how many total projects were identified, and how many were uh, how many began to do remediation on? And I think Jen's going to handle this question. <laughs> okay. So WSB did a preliminary analysis. They had looked at 131 slopes and then put them into those risk categories. These three that we are doing rose to the top, but there are 11 sites total that need some correction, and they're just uh, we have budget um, prepared every other year to start handling these areas. That's not bad for the amount of slope that's in Burnsville. So, thanks. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Mm, good. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you all for the questions. Thank you. And um, now we will be doing the open public input. Uh, if anyone's around that wants to comment, otherwise, um, there is an email, I guess, that they can comment on. That's correct. Oh, it's up there. There we go. So if you have any comments, you can go ahead and uh, email this email number. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the next presentation, and we're going to talk about the state of the lakes and review lake quality. Caleb from the, our natural resource specialist will be presenting for that. for having me commissioners and uh, as mentioned I'm here to give the state of the lakes presentation that's an annual update on uh, kind of what's going on water quality wise and some of our major water bodies here in town and again my name is Caleb Ashling I'm a natural resources specialist for the city of Burnsville uh, just a quick review on where the water in Burnsville is uh, headed uh, we're a part of three major drainage areas here in Burnsville uh, in southwest Burnsville, it's part of the Credit River drainage area. Uh, that's marked in green on this map. Uh, in, in east central Burnsville, uh, there's a portion of the city that drains to the Vermilion River. Uh, that's marked in orange on this map uh, and surrounds Lake Alamagnet. And then the majority of Burnsville uh, drains to the Minnesota River uh, uh, through Black Dog Lake. Um, or directly to the river uh, through uh, the Minnesota River or Black Dog Watershed, uh, and that starts, that's the tan area on this map. 
Uh, so that's the majority of the drainage area in town. And the water flows through a series of lakes uh, and ponds and storm uh, pipes uh, to get through the system. Uh, the water starts down at Lac Levon in southeast Burnsville. Uh, Lac Levon uh, doesn't outlet very often, but if it does, it drains to Keller Lake. Uh, Keller Lake drains to Crystal Lake. Uh, Crystal Lake drains to Twin, where it's joined uh, by water from Wood Pond. Uh, Twin Lake drains to Early Lake, over to uh, Sunset Pond, uh, down to Kramer uh, Nature Preserve through the wetlands there, and then on to the Minnesota River. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's how water is flowing through, through our lakes and through a lot of this uh, uh, watershed that drains to the Minnesota River. Uh, then we'd just like to highlight that uh, water is moving primarily uh, between these different water bodies uh, through our storm sewer system. Uh, so we have 6,500 storm drains here in Burnsville, and that connects uh, to 185 miles of storm sewers. So there's a, an extensive network of pipes that connect all these water bodies. And then in addition to the lakes that we have here in town, uh, we have a lot of ponds. Uh, so between the, the ponds and lakes, we have uh, nearly 300 uh, water bodies. And uh, many of those ponds are also a part of the storm sewer system and helping with flood control uh, and uh, nutrient reduction. Uh, so when we look at uh, the state of our water bodies here in town, we're looking at it uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first way is through the state's water quality standards. Uh, so the state has standards for a number of different pollutants, uh, the ones that we'll be focusing on uh, uh, and that we focus on for our program are phosphorus, which uh, feeds a lot of algae growth and other uh, water quality issues. Uh, chlorophyll A, which is uh, primarily an indicator of algae growth as well. And then water clarity, which also relates to algae as well as uh, sediment suspension in the water column. And then the state has uh, a standard for shallow lakes. Uh, shallow lakes are expected to be a little more nutrient rich, uh, have more issues with uh, sediment resuspension uh, so they're expected to have a little higher phosphorus and lower clarity. So the standards are a little less stringent for a shallow lake. And uh, there are standards for a deeper lake. And we have lakes that fall under both categories. Uh, the state considers a water body to be impaired if it fails to meet those water quality standards uh, two times over a 10-year period. Uh, we're in good shape in Burnsville. Most of our lakes are meeting the state standards. Uh, we do have two impaired water bodies currently. Uh, those are Alamagnet Lake and Keller Lake. And then I mentioned this last year when I was here, but I'd like to highlight it again. Uh, Crystal Lake was uh, removed from the impaired waters list in 2018, which we're, we're still excited about. Um, uh, and that's uh, not that common that a, a wa water body is able to come off the impaired waters list. There's a lot of them on there, especially in the metro area, but they don't come off very often. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, then another way that we look at our uh, water quality here in Burnsville is through the city's water resources uh, master plan clarity goals. Uh, so in addition to the state standards, the city has set its own clarity goals uh, for our major water bodies. And our clarity goals are all more stringent than the, the state standard. Uh, and then just, oh, uh, and these, the data that we're using to look at this are collected through a volunteer program uh, called the Citizen Action Monitoring Program. Uh, so we have volunteers out at all these different lakes who are going out uh, April through September or early October uh, collecting uh, water quality samples. Uh, the clarity is done by a secchi disc reading, uh, which is on the, the right hand of this uh, slide here. It's a black and white disc that's lowered into the water column. And when you lose sight of it, that's your clarity reading for that, uh, that time out. And then the samples are tested in a lab for chlorophyll A and phosphorus. Uh, so just highlighting uh, some of our water bodies that uh, we are uh, still working on, uh, Alamagnet and Keller Lake. Uh, these are our impaired waters. And you can see that our three-year clarity averages uh, are uh, below the goals that we're hoping to get, for, get to for these water bodies. Uh, so um, we still have uh, some work to go in those areas. Uh, Lac Levon Lake is our uh, lake with the best water clarity. 
that was actually recently listed on the Metropolitan Council, uh, the organization that runs the, the volunteer monitoring program as one of the uh, top 10 lakes in the metro area for water quality. Uh, so that lake's doing uh, really good. And then our other lakes, uh, just in general, uh, Crystal, Early, uh, Sunset Twin, uh, those are all uh, uh, meeting or exceeding the city's goals. Um, Wood Pond is slightly below, but close to the city's goal for, for that water body. And then uh, I'm just going to run through each of those water bodies uh, and give you a quick overview uh, on some of the conditions. Uh, so Lake Alamagnet, it's a shallow water body, uh, averages five or six feet deep. Um, it's fairly large at 104 acres. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the watershed in the, the last uh, five or six years. Uh, so we did an alum treatment on the two major storm ponds in Burnsville uh, last uh, two years ago, as well as adding an iron-enhanced infiltration trench on one of those storm ponds. Uh, those projects uh, should reduce nutrient inflow uh, into Element, Element Magnet Lake. Uh, and then the city of Apple Valley also has projects planned because a lot of the watershed is also within the city of Apple Valley. Uh, so they have watershed improvement projects or BMPs on their side of the watershed as well that should hopefully uh, continue to improve conditions on Al Magnet. Uh, so as you can see in the data here, uh, we're, we're not meeting the state standards yet. Uh, and, but we hope that through some of the work that we've been doing over the next uh, five or six years, we'll, we'll see some of those trends start to change. Uh, one thing we're looking at in Lake Alamagnet this year is a sediment resuspension study. Uh, we haven't seen, with some of the, the projects that we've installed in the past on Alamagnet, we haven't necessarily seen uh, the changes in the water quality data that we'd expect, and we're trying to figure out why that is. Uh, one thing that we're wondering about is that because it's a, a very shallow lake and it's a fairly long lake, uh, there could be sediment resuspension either from wind activity or boat activity uh, that's stirring up the water column, stirring up sediments uh, at the bottom of the lake, uh, and causing a lot of mixing that reintroduces a lot of phosphorus into the water column that could drive algae blooms. Uh, so we have a consultant who's uh, doing a sediment resuspension study uh, this summer, and hopefully that will give us some information on um, more about what's going on in Lake Alamagnet. All right, uh, on to Lac Levon Lake. Uh, so this is a, a deeper water body. Uh, it's 60 acres, and uh, in general, it, it's in great shape. Uh, so water clarity is 4.3 meters. Uh, so that's uh, well above the state standards. Um, and our goal is basically to, to keep things going like they're going on uh, Lac Levon. Uh, Lac Levon is an old gravel pit, um, and it does not have any uh, storm sewers running into it. So the drainage for Lac Levon is very small, uh, primarily from the adjacent homes and parkland in that area. So that helps improve the water quality in the lake. Uh, Keller Lake uh, is another water body um, that's uh, on our impaired waters list, uh, so we're still working to, to meet state standards at that lake. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this watershed as well. Uh, so in 2014, there was a large storm pond added uh, adjacent to the lake to remove phosphorus. Uh, two years ago, there was a large underground infiltration uh, basin added. Uh, it's near Crystal Beach, but it actually prevents uh, drainage or phosphorus from getting to Keller Lake. Uh, so that was uh, predicted to remove up to 70 pounds of phosphorus. Uh, and we also have an alum treatment planned, uh, which will likely happen, I believe, this Thursday. Uh, so we have a number of, uh, we've had projects and we have an upcoming project that should uh, reduce a lot of phosphorus. And we hope uh, over the next few years that we'll see uh, that show in the water quality data that we have for the lake. Uh, we have seen some changes already um, in, in some of the parameters. Uh, so our chlorophyll A, uh, which is a good indicator for algae growth throughout the season, uh, those readings on average had the, the two lowest values in the last 10 years for that lake. Uh, so that hopefully will be an early indicator of some uh, uh, good trends and changing water conditions out there. And I mentioned that we have that alum treatment planned uh, for uh, this week. 
And along with that, there will be a second alum dosing in uh, 2021 to continue uh, reducing in-lake nutrient flow at Keller. Uh, then on to Crystal Lake. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, conditions have improving, uh, have an improving trend on Crystal Lake, enough that it was able to be removed from the impaired waters list uh, in 2018. Uh, so things are looking good out at Crystal Lake. Uh, and the clarity reading that we had this uh, last year of 2.6 meters uh, was the best clarity reading that we have on record for the lake. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, good data back through 1980 and some intermittent, or intermittent data back through 1970. So uh, through all that time period, this is the best clarity reading that we've had. So that's a, a great sign. Uh, twin Lake uh, is a, a small water body. There's actually a North Twin and a South Twin Lake uh, that are along South Cross Drive on the east side of uh, Highway 35. That's a small water body, um, but it actually has uh, good uh, water clarity conditions and water quality conditions. It has a nice uh, robust native plant community there and lots of lily pads. Uh, and good native plant diversity that help compete with the algae and keep the water uh, clear. Uh, Wood Pond, uh, as was mentioned in a, a previous, the previous presentation, uh, Wood Pond had an alum treatment done in fall of 2018. Uh, hopefully that will help us improve some of the water clarity conditions out there. Uh, overall, we've uh, had pretty good uh, phosphorus readings on the lake and, and pretty decent uh, chlorophyll readings as well. Uh, water clarity is a little lower than we'd like to see, uh, but hopefully that alum treatment, which binds phosphorus, removes it from the water column, um, and doesn't allow algae to, to uptake it, uh, hopefully that will help improve clarity conditions out there um, in the future. And this is some pictures of the alum treatment. Uh, on to uh, Early Lake. So Early Lake is a, a fairly small and shallow water body, uh, 27 acres, and it has a pretty large watershed. It also includes drainage from the Burnsville Mall area um, and some fairly developed areas. Uh, the conditions have been good out there. Uh, this lake was actually removed from uh, the impaired waters list in, I believe, 2012 or 2013. So it has improving trends out there as well. Uh, we do have some asterisks on the, the data here. Uh, that's due to uh, some sampling issues uh, with the protocol that we had out there. Uh, there was some sediment that was getting into the samples, and that was skewing the, the results for, for our phosphorus data and the chlorophyll from last year. Uh, we have uh, done some retraining, and I think we have everything uh, set, um, but the, the data that we have for those parameters where the asterisks are shown uh, wasn't representative of the conditions on the lake, uh, so that's why those are there. Um, but overall, uh, clarity was uh, great last year at two meters. Uh, that's through the bottom, down to the bottom, and most of the, the lake there. Uh, and our Friends of Early Lake uh, group have reported the last couple of years that algae conditions have been uh, uh, very good. So. That's good. Uh, then on to Sunset Pond. Uh, so Sunset Pond is a, a shallow water body, a fairly large, 58 acres. Uh, and Sunset Pond has been uh, meeting state standards on average. Uh, it has, for a shallow water body, uh, a pretty good phosphorus levels and great clarity. Uh, the clarity on Sunset Pond may partially be due to the robust native plant community out there. Uh, so we have uh, a good uh, native plant uh, diversity and abundance throughout the lake. That helps pro provide a lot of competition for algae growth uh, and help keep the water clear. Uh, one issue we've had at Sunset Pond are seasonal algae issues. So uh, in past years we've had some spring blooms that have been problematic for, for a few weeks. Uh, and prior to that, it was more likely to be August blooms out there. And we're working on plans on how best to, to deal with those algae blooms. All right, uh, so that was kind of a quick run through of uh, where things are at, uh, as shown by our most recent water quality data. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Commissioners, any questions? I have one. Um, I noticed a couple of emails looking for volunteers for the wetland 
project, did, did you get enough people to do that? Yes. Uh, yeah, we have a program called the Wetland Health Evaluation Program. Uh, it's run by uh, Dakota County, I believe. But we, uh, we host them and ask them to monitor uh, four wetlands a year in town. Uh, and we had a good turnout. Uh, I don't know the exact number. I think it was 15 to 20. So we ended up with uh, a lot of people willing to help. Um, I have a question about the Lake Ellie Magnet. Um, when you do the sediment resuspension testing, if it does look like that's the issue, is there anything you can do with, with the sediment? It, uh, there may not be. Uh, we can work with residents to, to try to uh, reduce uh, boating under certain uh, time periods uh, on a um, resident willingness basis if, that, if boating seems to be causing issues. Uh, we're not changing any ordinances to restrict anything out there. Um, so that would be a possibility. And then it also could impact uh, uh, the future of projects like an alum treatment where you don't want a lot of resuspension of uh, sediments on an ongoing basis. Yep. Uh, and actually, yeah, thanks, Dana, for bringing up the sediment suspension. Um, you know, I see wind fetch is going to be going to be an impact potential boating um, fish. They uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the assemblages that are in the lake, but uh, if you have a bunch of ones that are mucking about in the bottom, I won't, yeah, I don't want to call them rough fish because they're fish. <laughs> but there are some native and non-native fish, and I'm assuming that I've seen a suspension a lot of plumes as they move through during breeding times, so there may be peaks and valleys, too, in their activity. So I'm wondering, is that, is that something they're going to look at? Yeah, and we do, we've had uh, fish surveys done um, uh, about every other year the last uh, seven or eight years. So we have a, a decent feel for the fish community in the lake. Uh, there's not a lot of um, carp, for example, um, which would, could potentially resuspend sediment. Uh, there used to be more uh, large bullheads, uh, which could also resuspend sediment. Uh, the city has done some fish stocking, uh, both for catfish um, and then largemouth bass to try to establish some predator fish that can maintain the bullhead population. Uh, another thing that we've seen is uh, stunted sunfish or you know, smaller sunfish out there. And from information we've received that sometimes when there's an overpopulation of sunfish and not enough food for them to eat, they can also dig into the sediments and cause some sediment resuspension. Uh, so the largemouth bass that uh, uh, we've been stocking in there, we hope will help to control some of those uh, sunfish as well. So we're working on that aspect of it uh, from the fish side of things. Was it, was it, uh, what was the original bottom where, you know, we realize there's been a lot of sedimentation since folks started doing more intensive activity, be it farming or now houses. Do you, was it originally a sand bottom system? Um, you know, I, I don't know the history of the lake well enough to, and I'm wondering if that's something too that there might be potential uh, sediment removal as as an option. Uh, we know that that's costly to do hydraulic or mechanical dredging, but has anybody is have those come up for any of the lakes? Yeah, so on Lake Al Magnet. Uh, the the bottom is primarily a muck bottom. Um, I know the. The western side of the lake uh, used to be, in some years, uh, more of a shallow marsh. Uh, so before it was, before the city was developed, um, before there was a lot of roadways and parking lots, there used to be a lot less water in Lake Alamagnet and many of our lakes. Uh, but as part of the, the setup of our stormwater system and to help mitigate flood issues and, and find places for our water, as we added uh, storm sewer pipes to the lake, that, that rose the water level uh, quite a bit. Uh, so we know that there's some fairly nutrient-rich wetland soils on the western arm of the lake, um, and the other, the other section of the lake was probably fairly shallow uh, as well with some mucky soils. Uh, so we haven't looked into sediment removal, um, but we do know that there's some natural uh, uh, phosphorus-rich soils in Lake Alamagnet. Um, and then on our other water bodies, uh, we haven't looked at a systematic large-scale sediment removal. Uh, we do have a, a a sediment removal program that's focused on uh, outfall areas. Uh, so those areas where we have a storm pipe uh, coming into a water body, whether it's a pond or a lake, 
Uh, we often get a focused amount of sediment buildup there, and those are more accessible for us to, to get equipment in there to dredge those areas and, and remove that sediment. So we do that on an ongoing yearly basis, uh, and we prioritize based on uh, where the worst sediment issues are. Doesn't strike me that that's a sol that's a reasonable solution to include then for uh, for alamagnet because it's originally a, a shallow, high nutrient rich setting. So originally, so that's probably just wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah, and we hope Thanks. we hope that uh, you know we the city has done a lot of water quality improvement projects uh, in the watershed. And there's more projects to come on the Apple Valley side of the watershed. And hopefully if we can reduce nutrient inflow, that can help uh, improve some of those conditions out there. So I noticed that Wood Lake is also looking like it's maybe on the border. At what point would that lake have to be added to the impaired water um, list? I maybe I caught, I missed the, the criteria early enough to, to compare the current kind of readings backwards, so... Yeah, if the, the uh, so if it failed to meet one of the standards over a, a, for two years over a 10 year period, it would have to go on the impaired waters list. And so far, I think, uh, I'm not sure offhand over that 10 year period, I think we missed uh, one of the, the levels like the clarity reading for one year. Uh, but overall, our conditions have been pretty good on Wood Pond. Uh, Clarity-wise, I think we have a goal of uh, 1.3 meters um, on Wood Pond, and that's the city's goal, but not the state goal. So our, our clarity goals are a little more stringent. So we have a little more work to get to the city's uh, goals, which are set in our Water Resources Master Plan, but we've uh, been meeting the state standards. Oh, helpful. Thank you. So you said you did some fish studies for various water bodies. Do you ever publish those in terms of what kind of fish and the quantity of them in the various lakes and ponds? Uh, we haven't made those available online. We certainly are willing to, to share with uh, anyone who wants that information um, to, to share the reports that we have. Um, and then in addition to the work that the city has done, uh, the DNR is also doing uh, fish surveys in numerous water bodies. Um, and you can find that information on the DNR's Lake Finder website. Any other questions? I just have a comment. I just want to commend the city and the mayor and everyone who's worked really hard to get our, our lakes back where they need to be. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is we're going to review the 2008-2019 deer report and proposed strategies for 2019 and 2020. Caleb will be presenting again. Uh, so my next presentation is on uh, the deer management program. Uh, this is our annual update. Uh, so just a little bit of background information on the program history. Uh, so the city developed a natural resources master plan in 1999. Uh, that plan recommended the development of a deer management program. Uh, the, the deer management plan was adopted by city council in 2001, and uh, among uh, other things, it set the population density goal uh, for the city, for, uh, for the deer population. Uh, the program is intended to address uh, a few different things. Uh, one is uh, deer vehicle collisions. So when we have a higher deer population in a developed area like Burnsville, we have more collisions with vehicles. It's also intended to reduce the negative impacts of uh, deer browsing on our natural areas. So a high deer population can in, in severely impact uh, native plants and native tree regeneration in natural areas. It also is intended to address landscape depredation by deer uh, on residential properties and then try to reduce the risk of uh, disease in the deer population. Uh, so what I'll be uh, reporting on is our 2018 and 2019 program year. Uh, that ran from April 1st of 2018 to March 31st of 2019. 
Uh, and then I'll be making some recommendations for our upcoming program year, 2019-2020. Uh, and so our program has uh, four components, and we'll kind of go over those uh, each individually. Uh, one is an education component, one is the feeding ban, uh, another is our monitoring components, and then population control. Uh, so for education, uh, we maintain our uh, uh, the section on the city website with educational information related to deer, uh, links to our deer management plan and annual reports, and updates on our deer management activities. Uh, we also try to periodically put information in the city newsletter related to deer, and then do some social media outreach related to deer on Facebook or Twitter or other, other methods that the city has. And this is a screenshot of, uh, uh, or uh, a snapshot of the article that was put in last year's city bulletin. And a lot of the information that we do uh, is just reminding residents of some of the issues related to deer feeding and why we, we request people do not feed deer. And then the city <laughs> does have a, a deer feeding ban. Uh, so uh, it is against city ordinance to feed deer if you'd like to feed uh, birds in Burnsville, your uh, feeder should be at least five feet off the ground or otherwise uh, uh, protected to prevent deer from accessing them. Uh, so we uh, get periodic reports from residents uh, that are seeing uh, violations of, of city code related to deer feeding. Uh, we had two feeding violations in 2018. Uh, this is a picture of what we typically see, some type of ground feeder that deer can access. Uh, and when we see a violation, uh, we do a site visit. Uh, if we can confirm the violation, we, uh, we send a letter. Uh, and then uh, we'll reinspect in 10 days. And in all the issues that I've been involved with, uh, that process has been enough. Uh, we send a letter. A lot of people are unaware of the ordinance. Um, and they'll, they'll fix their feeder set up, and uh, everything will be uh, fine from there. Uh, so we recommend just continuing monitoring and these action letters as needed for feeding issues. Uh, then to on to the uh, monitor, monitoring component of the program. Uh, so we have a few different ways we monitor. Uh, one is through an aerial count. Another is through our online monitoring forms, which are available to residents. Uh, we also track car de uh, deer collisions. And then we do a deer exclosure plant survey at Terrace Oaks Park every year. Uh, so when we're talking about monitoring or uh, population control, uh, we look at the city in, uh, the, in terms of our six different management zones. Uh, so we have a northeast, east central, southeast, northwest, west central, and southwest zone, uh, as shown on the map here. Uh, so that's how we'll, we'll frame some of the information going forward. Uh, so for our aerial count, uh, we conduct an aerial count uh, every year if conditions allow. Uh, that's primarily based on snow depth, so we need good snow depth in order to, to be able to accurately count the deer. Uh, the survey was conducted uh, on this year on March 15th, and it was conducted by the Three Rivers Park District. Uh, so the Three Rivers Park District conducts deer surveys throughout the metro area, uh, both in their uh, park reserves, like Murphy Hanrahan Park or Lake Rebecca Park, um, but also they work with cities to conduct aerial surveys uh, when cities request it. Uh, so this is a map uh, showing where the, the deer were observed. Uh, this map is also in the annual report. Uh, in the little circles there, you can see the number of deer that were observed at that spot. Uh, so for our aerial survey, uh, our total count in 2019 was 135. Uh, the largest area or concentration of deer uh, was in uh, northeast Burnsville. Uh, so we had 34 deer uh, counted in that area. Uh, that's the area of the uh, wildlife refuge, Minnesota Wildlife Refuge. Uh, so that tends to be an area of high deer concentrations. There, there's lots of habitat down there. Uh, then second highest was in southwest Burnsville. Uh, so uh, similarly, southwest Burnsville has a, a large amount of wooded lots, uh, uh, large properties, 
And in addition, it has Kelleher Park and the adjacent Murphy Hanrahan Park, which pr provides a lot of deer habitat. Uh, then we also had a, a fairly high deer population in East Central Burnsville around Terre Soaks, uh, Civic Center Park and Wolk Park, and in Southeast Burnsville in El Magnet Park. Uh, so this uh, table here uh, just shows our 2019 data compared to uh, other past years of survey data. Uh, we've had some variations in the results over the past several years for our survey data. Uh, we've gone, there's always uh, some variables year to year. Uh, one in some of our larger contiguous natural habitat areas like uh, the Wildlife Refuge or Murphy Hanrahan Park Reserve area. Uh, the deer don't follow our city boundaries. They, they move about uh, quite a bit um, from um, one, one, city to, one city to the next, uh, so we certainly can miss some deer that way. Uh, then also we have been uh, changing uh, over from a uh, city conducting the survey over to the Three Rivers Park District. Uh, that may have had uh, some, some uh, impact on the survey results that we've gotten over the past few years. Uh, but uh, we hope to, so there's a little more variation than we'd like to see in this. Uh, but I'd just like to emphasize that this is uh, a minimum count of the deer observed, and it provides us a baseline for making management decisions. Uh, so this, this gives us the information we need to, to make um, uh, some management decisions on how to proceed with our potential population control. And then for the citizen monitoring report, uh, we had uh, two submitted reports through our online monitoring system. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm sure there's more deer issues out there, just not everyone uh, knows about our monitoring report forms. Uh, but we had one a landscape issue reported in East Central Burnsville, where there was a, a herd of nine deer in some fairly developed areas. Uh, then also one report that was of a, a deer carcass uh, from a vehicle collision along a roadway in East Central Burnsville. Uh, then uh, for our uh, deer uh, vehicle collisions, uh, we track this annually as well. Uh, we use uh, two main sources of information. Uh, we use our Burnsville police records. So when someone reports to Burnsville police that there is a, a deer vehicle collision, uh, we can pull that information and uh, track the location and the date. Uh, then we also cross-reference that with our animal control contractor uh, who works for the city. Uh, they have information on the dates where they pick up a deer carcass and the location, and we cross-reference that information, remove any duplicates, and that gives us a minimum total of the vehicle collisions in the city. Uh, so this last program year, we had uh, 54 total car crashes, uh, a minimum from the information that we have. Uh, Southwest Burnsville is the, the area where we had the most uh, collisions. Uh, that, there were 14 down there. Uh, most of those were along County 5, where there's uh, some significant deer crossing areas. Uh, then we also had uh, 11 in East Central Burnsville, or, uh, Terrace Oaks Park area especially, and then 12 in the southeast portion uh, in various areas down there. Uh, so this is a little bit higher than we've seen in some past years. Uh, we've typically seen this more between 25 and 35. Uh, there may Winter conditions uh, over this last program year where we've had some heavy snow conditions may push the deer a little bit more into developed areas looking for potential free handout or, or something like that. And when the deer are pushed into more developed areas, then we're more likely to get vehicle collisions. And then we do a monitoring, or we do a, a plant survey uh, at Terrace Oaks Park every year. We've been doing this since 2001. Uh, we have six study plots there. Uh, three of those study plots are fenced. Three of them are unfenced. So the fenced plots, the deer can't get in. The unfenced <laughs> plots are accessible to the deer. Uh, and we do this to monitor the impact of deer browse. So it gives us a little bit of an idea of how the deer might be impacting vegetation. Uh, so one of the things that we've seen out there is that uh, the fence plots have uh, uh, more um, average cover of native plants, so wildflowers, shrubs, that type of thing. Uh, they're more dense and there's more cover in our fence plots uh, compared to our unfenced plots. Uh, so 94% average coverage in the fence plots versus 64% in the unfenced plots. Uh, 
and we've also seen that uh, so there are some specific species that uh, seem to be more impacted than others. Uh, gooseberry, for one example, is one that we found in higher abundance in our fence plots uh, compared to the unfenced plots. So potentially maybe uh, a preferred food source for the deer. And for our monitoring program, we uh, recommend continuing these annual monitoring methods that we've been doing. All right, uh, on to population control. Uh, so uh, based on our aerial survey, uh, we sometimes conduct population control for the deer herd. Uh, we have several strategies for that. Uh, we use archery hunting and sharpshooting by the Burnsville Police Department. Uh, so for our archery program, uh, we do encourage archery hunting on private property uh, where it's possible uh, according to city ordinance. Uh, the majority of areas where it's possible is in southwest Burnsville where people have larger lots. Uh, and then in some areas along the river valley there's some businesses that have uh, uh, quite a bit of acres down there that also do some archery hunting. Uh, then we operate archery hunts on public land where possible. Uh, so the one location where we have currently been uh, operating an archery hunt is at uh, Kelleher Park in southwest Burnsville. Uh, we operate this hunt with uh, another organization called the Metro Bow Hunters Resource Base. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization that helps cities and other agencies uh, conduct uh, population control hunts in some of these smaller, more developed uh, parks. Uh, so there were 10 deer harvested through the city's uh, uh, archery hunt this past fall, which is uh, right around our average for that uh, hunt. And then uh, the Three Rivers Park District also operates uh, a Metro Bow Hunters resource base hunt at uh, uh, Murphy Hanrahan Park. Uh, about 10% of that park is in Burnsville, so we count about 10% of our, their harvest towards our uh, population uh, control efforts. Uh, and they harvested 41 deer uh, this past fall. Uh, they've more typically been 15 to 25 deer in that harvest. Uh, they've modified their method to, to operate their hunt over two different weekends, and that seemed to be increasing the harvest, and it may help control the deer population in that area. Uh, so when warranted, uh, we do conduct sharpshooting with our Burnsville Police Department. Uh, sharpshooting is uh, done at sites that are selected by the police department for their safety, uh, so areas that uh, have a good backdrop and, and meet all safety criteria. Uh, we conducted sharpshooting in northeast Burnsville, uh, east central Burnsville, and uh, south, uh, the southeast unit uh, this past winter. Uh, there were five sharpshooting nights, and there were uh, 29 deer harvested in those nights. So we were fairly successful with our program over the, the nights that we were out there. And then uh, from those 29 deer, uh, we do uh, utilize the, the meat. Uh, so the meat is processed and it's donated to local food shelves. So there's two different food shelves in Burnsville that received uh, the venison from this program. And it totaled uh, just under 1,700 pounds of venison. So the harvest uh, for this uh, uh, past program year broken down by the different uh, uh, management units. Uh, the Northwest unit, uh, we don't have any accessible city land in that area, so we don't uh, conduct any management in that part of town. Uh, in the West Central unit, uh, we didn't conduct any sharpshooting in that area. We had fairly high goals in the other parts of town, uh, and the goals in the West Central unit were fairly low, so we decided to focus on other areas. In the southwest section of Burnsville, uh, there were uh, 14 deer harvested. Those were through the two archery hunts, the Murphy Hanrahan hunt and the Kelleher hunt. Uh, in northeast Burnsville, there were 17 deer harvested uh, at Black Dog Park, uh, Tennessee Park, and Cliff Fen Park. Uh, in east central Burnsville, there was four deer harvested at Terra Soaks. And then in southeast Burnsville, eight deer were harvested at uh, Ella Magnet Park. Uh, for a total of 43 deer through our sharpshooting program and through archery. Uh, so this uh, table compares the, the removal goals to the actual removals. Uh, so I'll just look at a couple of these. 
Uh, we had a fairly high deer count in the past program year, which uh, meant that the, the removal goals were high as well. Uh, so it's not always feasible for us to meet those goals with the limited number of sharpshooting sites that we have available to us in, in time to conduct sharpshooting. Uh, so we weren't able to, to meet the goals at our sites, um, but hopefully uh, through doing some population control, we can uh, keep uh, the deer population lower and reduce some of the vehicle issues and other issues that residents can have. And now moving on to the recommended harvest uh, for the 2019-2020 program year. Uh, so this table here shows the population goal for the different management units. Uh, so the population goal is the amount of deer that we'd like to see uh, in those areas. And uh, then the middle column here is the projected fall 2019 population. Uh, so we take our aerial survey from this past March. Uh, we use uh, uh, a calculation similar to the DNR uh, where we're calculating for uh, winter and summer mortality, uh, calculating for fawn birth, and that gives us a, a projected fall population. And from that, we base our removal goals. Uh, so uh, in northwest Burnsville, uh, we don't have access there, so we're not planning any management. Uh, west central Burnsville, uh, we're not planning any management there. Uh, southwest Burnsville, uh, re recommending up to harvest, a uh, harvest goal of up to 19 deer, uh, 16 deer in the northeast unit, and 21 deer in the east central, 22 in the southeast unit. Uh, for a potential total of 78 deer, Again, we can't always meet those goals, um, but uh, we work towards those goals uh, to try to keep the deer population at a healthy level. Uh, so we're recommending sharpshooting in the northeast, east central, and southeast uh, units. Um, and then the specific sharpshooting locations will be determined later this season based on deer activity within those units. And then we're also recommending continuing with the archery hunt at Kelleher Park. And we'd ask the commissioners to uh, review and uh, uh, recommend these dates for approval for city council. Uh, so we have four hunt periods at Kelleher Park, which has been our annual uh, protocol. Uh, September 19th through the 21st, October 17th through the 19th, October 31st through November 2nd, and November 14th through the 16th. Uh, so those are our four proposed hunt dates uh, for this upcoming fall at Kelleher Park. Uh, the Three Rivers Park District also plans on uh, conducting archery hunts within Murphy Hanrahan Park, a portion of which is within Burnsville. So we'd also uh, recommend approval uh, uh, by City Council of these hunt dates. Uh, those dates are October 11th through the 13th and November 22nd through the 24th. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Commissioners, any questions? Um, I just have one question. On um, item number six, where you were talking about the deer population, 18, there were 313 and 19, there are 135. Huge difference. Yes, yep, and uh, so uh, as I mentioned, there's some year-to-year uh, -year variations that can happen from a variety of factors. Uh, one is some migration of deer in and out of the city, especially in some of those larger natural areas. Uh, snow depth, the amount of snow depth we have during a survey can affect uh, the potential quality of the count and potentially missing some of the deer. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, we have been transitioning to a new survey system utilizing the Three Rivers Park District, and we've had some different staff uh, over that time period uh, conducting the surveys, and that can also result in some different results. So uh, that's more variation than we'd like to see, but we hope as we move into uh, this new system that we'll be able to stabilize that and not see as much variation in future years. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like for our actions, um, first, they're wondering if we want to recommend any changes to the City Council regarding the deer management strategies. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, so when you're using the uh, metro, metro area bow hunters resource base for conducting some of the archery hunts, are you 
are, are any of those youth mentored or are they capable partners or are they, you know, or is it a, is it a broad, relatively broad base of potential participants? It's a relatively broad base of participants. Uh, so it's just members of that organization and they, uh, they sign up for different hunts, they rate them on preference, and then they get selected for uh, our hunt, or it could be a hunt in a different area. Um, but I, the, the base protocol is they have to be a member of the Metro Bow Hunters Resource Base. On an on a unrelated idea, um, so when, when the sharpshooting is occurring, I'm assuming that it's being, they're doing shotgun slugs? Uh, they use rifles. Oh, they're using rifles. Okay, so then the, to the toxic shot issue doesn't really come up if, if they were using if they were using lead shotgun slug. Uh, then, you know, I guess if if there was any shotgun slug hunts or they were utilizing them on some of those sharpshooting th situations, um, it would be interesting to have a discussion about non-toxic shot. But since they're using, uh, you know, since they're using rifles, it sounds like, you know, and are, it sounds like they are. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, they are using rifles. Uh, we do use lead ammunition for the rifles. Okay. Uh, due to um, uh, less path pass through potential, okay. uh, we use uh, the, the officers uh, use headshots, so there's uh, minimal impact on potential lead in the in the meat. Okay. Um, so that's that's good to be able to do that. I guess I, I guess I'd still be interested in seeing if there was an option for using non toxic shot in these settings because I think that's going to be a way forward as a good example to kind of help lead towards you know towards pe better adoption of non toxic shot because a lot of people. Yeah, yep, and that's certainly something uh, we've discussed and continue to discuss with, with our program as well. Okay, thanks. Any when other doing, questions? Oh, sorry. When you're doing sharpshooting, are you doing any type of selection in terms of doe, buck, that type of thing, or is it just whatever you're able to find? Yeah, the goal is to, to harvest does because that is well, primarily what's driving the population. Uh, so the that's uh, the primary goal, but sometimes if there's uh, bucks there as well, uh, and they're on their own. Those will be harvested. They they do get hit by vehicles as well. Uh, but if we really want to have a population impact, uh, the best way to do that is by targeting the does. Thank you. I, think, I don't think any other questions. Um, is there any recommendations um, to changing the deer management strategies for a city council? Oh, you're doing a good job. My perspective. Pardon. They're doing a good job. Yes. Okay. Keep up the work that you guys are doing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and they also, um, I guess, we want to make a recommendation on the actual hunt dates and locations, correct? That's correct. Okay, yeah. do we want to have a motion I, for that? I move we accept the hunt dates as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank <laughs> a lot you of information too. tonight. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yep. And the next item on the agenda is miscellaneous. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, I do have a couple of items for you tonight. Uh, I would like to remind you that this Thursday, June 6th, uh, from 11 a.m. until 9, 9 p.m., yeah. is a uh, party on the plaza at Nicollet Commons Park. There will be food trucks, there will be entertainment, there will be crafters and vendors. Uh, please stop down if you have a chance, and it's an open invitation to everybody in the community to come join us. Um, also, on Saturday, June 15th, is the Back to the 80s event and food truck festival out at Burnsville Center parking lot. Uh, so, again, uh, another fun event for the family to, to come out and uh, uh, spend some time together. That is from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m., and then uh, one of the things that maybe Caleb uh, should be sharing with the group is uh, the return of his uh, return of his favorite animals to Burnsville. <laughs> right, please go, Caleb. Uh, sure. Yeah, I can update the commissioners that uh, we are continuing with our prescribed grazing uh, pilot project this year, and we are anticipating the goats will be arriving uh, this week, uh, potentially tomorrow. Um, so they will be out here at uh, Civic Center Park. 
Um, they should be here this week, and uh, we expect them to stay about two weeks. And the, the goal of this program is to reduce buckthorn on site and also promote the growth of a healthy native plant community. So they don't eat the native plants? They just eat the buckthorn? Uh, they prefer a woody browse, so that's their preference, but they do eat other things as well. Uh, but through our strategy, we're trying to, to reduce the uh, buckthorn because that's uh, one of the primary things that's there. And then uh, when they eat, eat through the buckthorn, that gives all the understory plants a chance to, to flourish. Same spot as last year by the hockey arena? Yep, yeah, it's by the outdoor ice rink or hockey arena right here at Civic Center Park. So we invite all the commissioners and anyone watching to stop out and check out the goat's work. They have quite a following, that's why I felt that it <laughs> wasn't necessary. But that's, uh, and our next meeting is scheduled for July 1st. Okay. So. Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn? Just a quick question. Oh. All of these uh, dates that you are giving, JJ, is there a place on, the, uh, on a website or anything else yeah. where people can go and look at it? Yes, there is. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Roof. Uh, on the city's website, there is a calendar of events. Um, and all this information for Party on the Plaza, food truck festivals, um, any other big events that might be happening uh, in the city or the city's involved with will be listed on that website and on that calendar. Thank you. Okay. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Right. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? <laughs> Good night, and thanks for watching the Parks and Natural Resource Commission meeting.